All well, glories to Hiranya Kashipu, who made this pastime possible. Without him, we wouldn't have the pastime. Hare Krishna. <clears throat> Radha Madhava. Jira the Madhava, Jira the Madhava, Punjabi Hari, Jaya Radha Madhava, Punjabi Hari. Kupi jana balba giri bara dhari Kupi jana balba giri bara dhari Chishodhanandana rajajana ranjana Chishodhanandana Raja Jana Ranjana Chishwada Nandana Raja Jana Ranjana Chishwada Nandana Raja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Bhana Chari Jamana Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Sisi Radha Madhava Kije Kantaraj Simad Bhagavatam Kije Tai Gopamanandi Hari Hari Bo. I'm wondering if any of you are thinking that <clears throat> it's awkward to be chanting to Radha and Madhava if we are talking about Lord Nishingadeva and Prahlad Maharaj. Does any of you think like that? Like it's kind of like two different things that are not compatible? And um, so we, we have to begin by explaining that, the compatibility of it. Because as you know, we are supposed to read, to be able to understand the 10th canto, we have to study the first nine. And so um, Prahlad Maharaj in many ways is an ideal example for us. And, and Lord Dishingadev is the incarnation of Krishna whom we worship to overcome the obstacles, specifically in Arthas, and also to protect us, but also the biggest protection we need is protection from our own minds and our own desires. Krishna, 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 hey, Krishna, 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 Pahima, protect me. All right, yeah. But that's one of the biggest things we need protection from, our own, our own devious tendency and own material desire. So, how will we understand Radha and Krishna unless we become free of anartha? Obviously, we won't. And therefore, hearing about Prahlad and Nishingadev, it's purifying. And as I said, um, last class or last few classes, there's a little bit of Aranyakashipu in all of us. So, uh, hopefully, by hearing these leelas, that little bit of Aranyakashipu, or the big bit, whatever it might be, can be reduced or entirely eliminated. And that way we become qualified to enter into Radha Krishna Lila. So there is a direct connection there, right? Does that make sense, Nadia? Yeah. Yes. And as I've been saying, Prahlad Maharaj is our exemplar He's setting an example. And I mentioned a, a few classes ago in the conversation between Prahlad Maharaj and his father, as a conversation ensued, 
Prahlad Maharaj was just exhibiting compassion and his father was exhibiting hatred, anger. And so, you know, it's a nice story because you have this contrast between a saint, a saintly boy, and the biggest atheistic demoniac person that's been known to have walked the planet. One, one who has like no compassion at all. His only interest is what will benefit me. You know, he's like maybe the Adi narcissist. Um, Hiranyakashipu, you know. It's like, look at, if, to fulfill my desire, if I have to kill, destroy, so be it. And Prahlad Maharaj, I think, I think one of the places we left off, Prahlad Maharaj is saying, I'm good because I'm your devotee. And just by thinking of you, I'm happy, but I'm not happy that all the people in the material world are without you. So then Prahlad Maharaj exhibits the quality of compassion, which is totally opposite from what Hiranyakashipu is exhibiting, right? He is like, he doesn't, and you see that with Kangsa, didn't care, kill all the children, you know, this, any one of them could be Vishnu, so just kill them, get rid of them, for what? To protect myself. So, Prahlad Maharaj's, his mood is, don't go back to Godhead alone. Hiranyakashi's Pooh's mood is, who needs to go back to Godhead? I'm God, I'll control the universe. A little bit different mentality, wouldn't you say? Slightly different, right? Uh, so, now we're seeing the story as it ensues, or we're, we're kind of, I guess, I guess this dynamic comes up is going to come up more in devotee, non-devotee. And so Prahlad's exhibiting like this intense tolerance, intense forgiveness, intense compassion. And Hiranyakashipu is exactly the opposite. So hopefully we'll become inspired by Prahlad Maharaj. We need, we need insp inspiration to to change our behavior. Changing behavior is not easy. We need inspiration in sadhana. In, in so many ways, we need inspiration. And one of the ways we get inspiration is by hearing about the activities of pure devotees. Because when you get inspired, the inspiration comes in the form of, I want to be like them. I want to be like Prahlad. I want to have these qualities. And we just did a Japa retreat this weekend, and I was talking about this phenomenon where we do something, sometimes we do something and then we regret doing it. And sometimes we say something like, I hate, I hate myself, or I hate myself when I do that. So, so devotees were saying, well, how do you change that? And I say, well, if you live long enough, you, you will hate that aspect of yourself so much that it will drive you crazy that you will just change it at some point. You, you won't be able to live with yourself anymore. So I can't go on another day unless I control this anger, or I'm sick of being envious, or this pride is just ruining everything in my life. It might take you your whole life to finally come to that point, you know, so when you're older, you're like, I, I don't want to die with this in me. So I was telling them, that's a lot of years to carry that, why don't you just get rid of it now, and then, and then it's, let's just let it be gone for the rest of my life. So, and you might say, well, is it that easy? And the answer is yes and no, because unless we come to the point where we're fed up with something, we'll never give it up. That's the nature of Maya. And so if we can become inspired by Prahlad Maharaj, oh, he's so tolerant, he's so humble, he's so forgiving, he's so compassionate. And, and I want to be that way. I'm sick of not being that way. I'm sick and tired of being a bit of Hiranyakashipu. I want to get this inspiration from Prahlad. Then it's possible to change. There has to be that, that impetus on an emotional level, not an intellectual level, because the intellectual level is where we have a problem because we know, we, you know, you know every, you've been a devotee like eight months, a year, you know everything. You know what you're supposed to be like. It doesn't mean you will be because it's, it's only intellectual and you haven't felt it strongly enough that you need to change. So when you feel it strongly, 
then you change. When you intellectualize it, you may or may not. Generally, people don't change a lot from intellectualizing it. They change more when they suffer. And so you might say, well, maybe I just have to suffer more. But with a little self-compassion, you can think, why should I cause myself suffering for so many years? And you can start to feel the suffering now of what it's going to be like to suffer all those years. So that thought can actually be an impetus to change. Thinking, I don't want to suffer like this. This is not right. I shouldn't, I shouldn't do this to myself because eventually I'll change anyway at some point because I won't be able to live with myself unless I change. So if I'm going to change anyway, um, why not now? And a little insight, ladies and gentlemen, most of you are younger than I am. It doesn't get easier to change tomorrow. Everybody thinks, yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. Well, the problem is every day we wait, it actually gets harder because the conditioning remains another day. So it's just another day of conditioning to break. So thinking, you know, when I'm older, I'll do it because I'll be smarter and I'll be more sense controlled, more disciplined. Maybe, but the problem is you'll be more conditioned by it because you've had more years to practice your anger or your resentment or your whatever it is that you're trying to overcome. And I think it's, I think it's a, a common or natural way to think if I show up in the world sometimes acting in a way which I myself hate and I have to live with myself, why should I subject myself to that kind of pain? It just makes sense, doesn't it? If I at all care about myself, why do I want to live with all this guilt knowing I shouldn't get angry, I shouldn't be envious, I shouldn't this or that, and then I have to live with it. And so what do I do with it? I run away from it, I suppress it, I lock it in the closet. I don't want to face it because it's so painful to show up as someone you don't want to be that you just want to pretend you, you're not like that. You don't want to even think about it, right? So why subject yourself to that kind of life? So, so oh, but it's so hard to change. Yeah, yeah, but actually, just objectively looking at it, it's harder to show up as somebody you hate than it is to change. Believe me, it's, much, it's a much more difficult life to show up as someone you can't stand than it is to work to change it. And, and, and never say, I can't change. There are obviously some things we can't change. Well, you could change the color of your hair, right? You could put um, contacts and change the color of your eyes. So there's a lot of things you can change. Okay, maybe you're extroverted, maybe you're introverted. That's your personality type. Okay, that's just how you are. But the anarthas, they, they can be removed. They can be purified for sure. And so whenever we say I can't change, it's either because it's a, a permanent inherent quality, which is not conditioned in the sense of it being molded in a certain way. It's just that's, that's inherent to your nature. But our demoniac nature is not inherent. Otherwise, if it were, why would Krishna say that to, to renounce or to give up these things or purify them? Because he's, he's not going to tell us to do something that's impossible to do. So, so really, when we think we can't change, it's, it's a perception, it's a wrong perception that I've been like this for so long. This is who I am. How could I be anybody else? But, but Krishna consciousness, if, if Krishna consciousness is to make us pure, pure devotees, if that's the process, then Krishna consciousness is supposed to make us somebody else, right? That's the whole process. So to think I can't be someone else is, is actually contrary to to everything Krishna says, do this, don't do that. No, Krishna, I can't. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna follow your instruction. I can't do it. Like, would you say that to Krishna when he told you to do something? You should give up your anger. I can't. I was born angry. I'm just always I'll always be angry. That's just who I am. It's my it's my identity. I don't think you would say that to Krishna. You would say, How do I do it? Help me. That's what you would say. I want to, I need to. So, and, and the, the real kicker to all of this is if we, the more we do it, the closer we get to Krishna, the more we understand Krishna like that. Correct? I have a strange feeling everyone's going to show up at 930, right? And I'll have to summarize everything I said. 
Anyway, I also have a strange feeling that by Sheshika and Hovi are supposed to come at 10. I have a strange feeling they're not going to come at 10, and we could have done the class later. But anyway, in the mood of service, we're trying to serve the Vaish a great Vaishnava. So we will see what happens. Hare Krishna. So what what did you say we were we left off, Tanya? We stopped on uh, seven nine forty three. That's the last one we we read. Seven nine forty three. It's nice to have someone around who I can ask things that I don't remember. Okay. Oh. So I'm trying to hold, hold on, I went the wrong way. Call it up. If you don't have the database on your computer, you should get it. You can get it online and just, you know, stream it, but it's, there's more, there's more on it if you, and it's easier to use if you put it on your computer or your phone. If you can figure out how to do it. And if you can't figure out how to do it, find a seven-year-old Chinese girl. She'll help you. Okay. Or an Indian, a 12-year-old Indian. So the last verse we read was actually quite a famous verse. I'm going to chant the Sanskrit. This is verse 43. See if you recognize it. Nayod vijay para darat yayai baitaranyas. Tvadvirya gayana mahamrita magna chitta. So, Chaitato Mukha Chaitasa Indriyata. Maya Shukaya Bharam Udbhato Vimudha. Any of you recognize that verse? If you, um, if you listen to lots of Prabhupada lectures, you will recognize these verses because um, Prabhupada has a repertoire of verses, and amongst the repertoire, there's specific verses that get quoted a lot. And so, if you listen to a lot of lectures, sometimes you end up memorizing those verses because you've just hear them so much. So this is a famous verse by Prahlad Maharaj, and we had discussed it, I believe, this is where we, we had discussed this verse. Is that correct, Tanya? This was what I was, the last verse I spoke about? Or is this the next verse? I think this was the, the last we spoke about. But I thought, so I'm gonna go over it a little bit. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll bring it up so you can, we'll have a little Sanskrit class right now. Sanskrit is good to learn since all our books are written in Sanskrit. If you learn a little bit of Sanskrit, I mean, those of you who speak more than one language, you, you should probably have not such a difficult time learning Sanskrit. And I, someone said Russian, there's a lot of Sanskrit in Russian. Is that true? I know in Lithuanian it is. So, yes. okay, so, um, I'm going to go through the word meanings and we can have some discussion. Um, as we go through the word meanings, it will help us understand. So, na, not, eva, certainly. So, na, is not or no in like a million languages, also in Sanskrit. Eva, this word, um, if you've read Bhagavad Gita and learned any verses, the word eva comes up a million times. Certainly. Certainly, uh, as they say in New York. So it's just emphasizing, you know, like this is not, not is one thing, but certainly not. I find that a lot in Sanskrit. And then Udvijay, I am disturbed or afraid. In other words, certainly I'm not afraid. Para, para means supreme. So he's addressing Krishna as para. Um, and then Duratyaya, Duratyaya, this comes up Bhagavad Gita chapter seven, I think verse 14. Mama Maya Duratyaya. Duratyaya means insurmountable. It comes up a lot, you know, insurmountable. And it always, not always, but it's generally referring to the three modes of nature, the material world, the, the Bhava, the Bhava Sindhu, the world of birth and death. It's Duratyaya, you can't get out. And what's the proof? You're still here. That's the proof of Duratya. If it wasn't Duratya, we would all been out of here long ago. 
right? But we haven't figured out how to get out of here yet because it's direct. Yeah, yeah, you can't figure it out on your own. You need some guide to help you. So, um, Duratyayai Baitaranyas. Baitaranya is the river. Um, it's a river which divides the material world and the spiritual world. When you get to the Baitaranya River, if you cross it, you're in the spiritual world. So he's saying that river, yeah, you can't cross it. That it's insurmountable or difficult, at least difficult. Baitaranya, the river of the material world. Twatvirya of your lordship's glories and activities. So virya, virya, twat means yours, twa, you, twat, virya. Virya means power. Vira, you ever heard the word vira? Vira, vira bhadra, power and auspiciousness. So virya, your lordship's power, and Prabhupada translates, translates it as your activities. In other words, your, your leelas, gayana, Gayana, Bhagavad Gita, Gaya, Gayana means to sing. Mahaprabhu Kirtana Nritya Gita. Kirtana Nritya. Oh, that's singing. Yeah, but Gaya, um, Gita song, Gaya is to sing. So, so he's saying, Tvadvirya Gayana, which basically means when I sing your glories, Mahamrita. So you all know what Amrita is, like Charan Amrita. Amrita is nectar, charna is feet, the nectar of the feet. You know, you take charna amrita because it's bathed Krishna's feet. It's nectar that's bathed his feet. And mritu means death, and amrita means deathless. So sometimes amrita, the word amrita, uh, it becomes, a, um, becomes deathless, and sometimes Prabhupada translates it deathless nectar. Like they mean this, they mean both Amrita, eternal. Amrita. So ma, what does Maha mean? We all know Maha means great, great nectar, Mahamrita. So your I sing the the glories, your Twadvirya Gayana, I sing your glories. And what happens? This nectar, Magna Chitta. Chitta means consciousness, right? Cheto Dharpana Marjam, cleanse the consciousness. Chitta. You may set chit. Ananda, chit means consciousness, knowledge. Um, and this word chitta is used often. So magna means absorbed. So what does this mean? When I sing your glories, my mind, my consciousness is absorbed in big nectar, great nectar, a lot of nectar, an ocean. Actually, I think Prabhupada translates it as an ocean, right? Magna chitta, I'm absorbed in a Great ocean of nectarine spiritual bliss. That's Prabhupada's translation. I'm actually giving you the translation without going the word for word. Um, I know most of these words. All right. Soche, na sochiti kangchiti. You know that verse? Soche means to lament. You Well, we all know about lamentation. You didn't all may not know that that's the word in Sanskrit. Na sochiti na kangchiti. So lamentation comes up in the Gita. Um, I am lamenting. Who am I lamenting for? Vimukha. What is mukha? You know, um, Prabhupada translates it as fools and rascals, the the asses, basically. Um, and V means especially big time. So if you put V in front of a word, it emphasizes like this: you're not just an ordinary fool, first class fool. You know, king of the fools. So um, especially foolish. Foolish. Um, uh, so, vimukha chetasa means they, um, yeah, their consciousness is foolish. They don't have Krishna consciousness. And what's the proof? Indriyarta. And in arta, indriya. Indriya means senses, arta means benefit. They live only for the benefit of their senses. Have you heard that word before? Indriyartam? It comes up a lot. Indriya, you've heard. Indriya means senses. Indri artha. Artha means benefit. Sometimes artha means wealth, right? You know, dharma, artha, kama, moksha, artha, dharma, do religion, economic development. So sometimes it means money, and sometimes it just means benefit. To benefit your senses. 
I am lamenting for these fools and rascals because all they do is act to benefit their senses. Maya sukaya, sukha means happy, like we have a disciple, sukada, one who gives happiness. Sukha dukada, don't be affected by happiness and distress. Sukaya. Maya, so what is Maya Sukaya? The happiness of Maya. Your name is Maya Sukaya Devi Dasi. I, I won't name you that. Probably not, right? We want to name you Krishna Sukaya, right? Guru Sukaya, you know, the happiness of being absorbed in Guru and Krishna. So Maya Sukaya means, in this, in this sense, the word, um, let's see, how, yeah, the illusion of happiness, and then bottom means burden. It also means big, or one in some Hindi it means big, bottle, bottle, or great. Here it means burden. Um, it's interesting the burden of try of trying to be happy, basically there. Um, yeah. The the, bur the burden of doing all these things to get, because you're bewildered by my, you have to do all these things to be happy. And then um, this word vimudhan comes up. We had vimukha, and then vimudhan is the last word, which means big fool, mudha. You know the word mudha, you've heard that? It's sometimes translated as ass. And the word udvahata, um, Udvata means lifting. So they're lifting the burden, material burden of trying to be happy uh, in Maya, full of, full of Maya. They're, and because they're fools, that's what they do. But, so, so I'm thinking of those people and Soche, I'm lamenting. That's Prahlad Maharaj. And Hiranyakashipu is thinking, anyone in my way, kill him. That's it. But why do you want to kill them? Because I don't like them. That's why. Did you know, if you know anything about Greek, the Greek um, mythology, a lot of times the gods will say things like, will be asked the question, why did you kill that person? Or why did you want to kill that why do you want to kill that person and they'll say something like i don't like them or i feel like it did you know that like the the, the greek gods are like i'll just say a bit weird right that's so that's the demoniac the demoniac mood is like if it benefits me let's do it well, what is going to cause pain to other people? Well, that doesn't matter. That's not our standard. And so Prahlad Marsh's standard is like, I'm fine. I don't need anything. I have you. Nobody else has you. And that pains me. I'm lamenting. So um, you ever, you know, this is a question that um, new devotees ask a lot. They ask, they ask this question, you know, they're like, lament. How can you lament if you're, like, if you're a devotee, how can you lament? And just to confuse you even more, how can you lament and be happy in the same sentence? Like, okay, spin your head around that one. You know, it's like, like a devotee, nasochiti, nakanshiti, he's not hankering, he's not lamenting. And now we're reading this verse and it uses, and Prahlad say, I'm lamenting. And then the verse before that, he says, magna chita. Mahamrita Magnachit. I'm absorbed in the ocean of nectar in the next sentence and I'm lamenting. Like, what's going on here? So, isn't that a devotee doesn't never laments? Because Krishna says a devotee doesn't lament. <clears throat> Interesting, isn't it? Like, are, are we not supposed to lament if a devotee leaves this world? Are we not supposed to lament if a, lament if a devotee runs into suffering? The answer is yes, there's something wrong with you if you don't, but that lamentation is not material. Like if we don't lament for the condition of people in this world, that means our heart is like stone. 
We've got a bit of Hiranyakashipu. We need some surgery to crack that stone-like heart. We need some sharp nails to chisel it, right? So lamentation is perfectly fine as long as you lament transcendentally. And I've told you stories before where Prabhupada exhibited very deep compassion and just, just seeing people engaged in their daily activity. And he was, uh, was feeling so sad for them. They weren't even feeling sad for themselves. He was feeling sad for them because he could see how much they were suffering. And so he's fine. He's got Krishna. He's happy, right? He's got, you know, thousands of disciples, everything he, everything he wants to do to serve as Guru Maharaj, he has disciples helping him. He's, he's absorbed Mahamrita Magnachita. And he's seeing, he's seeing non-devotees working hard every day. And it's, pain, it's painful for him to see that. He's lamenting, Prabhupada's lamenting. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we, we, if, if we are lamenting for the condition of people in this world, that is a sign that we have compassion and it's a sign that we're advancing in Krishna consciousness. If we're not lamenting, it's not a good sign. It means the heart needs some softening, right? And Prabhupada, right from the very beginning of the Krishna conscious movement, he was telling us, go out and help other people. Be compassionate, like day one. You know, you you move in the temple, they shave your head, and an hour later they give you a book bag. Okay, get out there. Isn't it something like that? At least it was when I joined. I was already out there before I moved in the temple. That was just that was just what you did. So we can all pray to Prahlad Maharaj to have that kind of compassion. Now one thing that is is so interesting, and it, for me, it's as pretty inconceivable. None of us like to suffer. Suffer, especially physical suffering, can be unbearable sometimes. I had the other night. I had my stomach was burning so much I couldn't sleep. I woke up. Ah, I don't know what what, what happened. It's like burning, burning, burning so much that it woke me up, I couldn't sleep. And um, it was very, very painful. And like, and like you, you ever been in a situation where you're in great discomfort or pain and you're thinking, if it gets any worse than this, I'll just wanna die, right? Or I'll faint, something like that. So for most of us are, you know, we have a tolerance level with pain and None of us would really pray to be in pain. That's quite uncommon. So now we see the example of great devotees like Prahlad Maharaj and Vasudev Dutta, who I believe was an incarnation of Prahlad Maharaj. We see him saying to Mahaprabhu, give me the karma of all conditioned souls and let them go back to Godhead. You know, so you've probably heard that story or read it. But anyway, let's meditate on it, even if you haven't. He he was feeling he was feeling so bad that the living entities were entrapped in this world. He asked Mahaprabhu, could I take the karma and that way they could all go back to Godhead and I'll just stay here and suffer? Now just imagine taking the karma of, of how many billions of people were on the planet at that time, inconceivable, right? Considering how, we, how much we don't like pain and how much we like to feel good and be comfortable. And, and here the devotee says, it's, it's like he's saying, I'm suffering more seeing them suffer than I would suffer if I just took their karma. That will be less suffering for me. Inconceivable, isn't it? And imagine 
we had 8 billion people in the world who felt like that, it would be quite an amazing place, wouldn't it? That everybody is willing to suffer for other people. Wow. All you could say is, wow. Well, I would say that's, that's wow on steroids. That is just, and, and this is, this is, you could say, this is what Prabhupada was grooming us to be, to be like that. And I always joke with devotees, I say that, you know, when you want to become a devotee, if they have a contract and you have to agree to principles, and that would be one of them, you have to suffer on behalf of conditioned souls, we wouldn't have so many members, I don't think. You have to take the karma. Sometimes, Sometimes when I do workshops, I actually feel like I'm taking the karma of people, even more than when I give initiation. Um, the Siksha Guru also takes karma, right? And when Prabhupada was asked, do you take karma? He said, yes. And therefore, it is said, the Guru should not have take too many disciples because he has to take the karma. So, of course, Prabhupada took many disciples so naturally, everybody's wondering, well, you're saying the guru shouldn't take many disciples, and you have thousands of thousands. So Prabhupada knew we were thinking like that, and he said, but I'm prepared to go to hell for Krishna. So, you know, that's the example. That's it's like that. You know, we're trying to figure that out as conditioned souls who are just thinking, you know, what I'm going to have for breakfast. You know, well, for you guys, it's probably dinner some of you, right? Um, isn't it? Have you noticed, like, when the body's tired or hungry, it's like, it's about all you can think about? Like, to hell with everyone else. Where are my chapatis? You know, it's like, that's where we're at. So it's, it's really difficult to understand how someone could not be interested in those things. But the fact is that when someone is that Krishna conscious, where their, their own bodily existence is, is, uh, is not really an issue, because they're, they're so ecstatically, they're so, they have so much love for Krishna, that um, it leaves, oh, open space for them to love everybody because they're not absorbed in only loving themselves or their wife or husband or kids. So, and Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, and in different places, Prabhupada explains the principle that when you love Krishna, what do you get with love of Krishna? You know, like sometimes you buy some headphones and then they give you adapters in it and cords, cables. You know, it's funny, you know, you as a side point, sometimes you buy something, you know, it's quite good, but it's made in China and it's inexpensive and they give you all these other things with it. If you were to buy those things separately in America, each one of those would cost more than the whole package you bought. It's, it's so, um, so Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains and I'm Prabhupada explains, when you love Krishna, what happens? Who else do you love? Your belly, your tongue, no. You love everyone because everyone is son and daughter, every living entity. So you can't, basically the way they explain it is you can't love Krishna and not love everybody. When you love Krishna, you love everybody. When you hate Krishna, you hate everybody. It's like, and you're thinking, oh, that's not a nice thing to say that I hate everybody if I, that I even hate Krishna. Okay, well, let's make it nice, we'll say it. If you don't like Krishna a lot, you may not like everybody a lot, something like that, right? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed there's some people you don't like a lot? Well, now you know why, because maybe you don't like Krishna a lot, and that's why you don't like them a lot. Just, just saying, maybe, you know, you can take it or leave it. <clears throat> Uh, is I'm just repeating Bhakti Vinod Thakur. You can take it or leave it as you like, but that's what he said. So you can meditate on it. Hare Krishna. 
anyway, um, it's it's important for us to to understand the correlation between our own our own desires for comfort, for pleasure, and our desires and and the manifestation of compassion. They're really different. It's not that we don't need comfort and pleasure. We need to eat. We need to sleep. We need certain levels of comfort, of course, but we're not absorbed. That's not the goal of our life. That's just facilitating maintenance of the body and soul so we can serve. So if, if a devotee is on that level, all the space is then open to, to when I say love other people, it's, it's really also means to feel their pain. You know the verse in the Gita, Krishna says, by his own experience, he can understand the pain of others. In the Krishna book, Prabhupada said, poor people will tend to be more charitable because they know the pain of poverty. And so they feel it. And so, and even, very interesting, one of the acharyas says, the devotee is more compassionate than Krishna because the devotee comes, he gets a material body and he suffers and he knows, what's, he knows what suffering is. Krishna doesn't know. He never suffered, right? Of course, he can know everything. But anyway, it's explained that way. So you know the suffering of others by your own suffering. So there's this exercise that sometimes we do. And maybe we do it in the forgiveness workshop. Where you think of another person, it, it's, it's based on this verse. As you suffer, you understand the suffering of others by your own experience. So you look at another person and you think that person is probably got some worries on their mind, because I do. And that person probably has had some tragedies in their life, because I have. And that person has probably suffered some physical pain. They've probably suffered some loss some disappointment because I have. And so you it's such an easy way to awaken compassion because we're all compassionate for ourselves, aren't we? Because of all the suffering we've gone through, right? <clears throat> so once you relate that to other person and think and thinking they must have also experienced all those things as well that I have because we're all in the same boat, then by comparison to yourself, you can develop compassion for others. Long ago, I was talking about this topic, and I was saying, I was saying, you know how sometimes your mind gets upset, and you like, it's just upset, and you you know, it's like, it's going to subside, you know, a few hours or whatever, until it subsides, it's driving you crazy, or sometimes you're really hungry, but you're not home and you're just going to have to tolerate it. Or sometimes you need to use the restroom, but there isn't one and you have to wait and you have to tolerate it. And we, we just go on and on with all these things we have to deal with because we have bodies. And of course, because everyone else has a body, everyone else is dealing with it also. So we all know one another quite well. It's quite awkward to have a material body. I mean, we, we don't, we're used to it, but if you had a spiritual body and you didn't have to sleep and you didn't have to eat and you didn't have to cook and you didn't have to service your body, that's the politically KC, that's the KC PC way to say it. Um, <laughs> we would really, we would really think, wow, having a body, it's a real hassle. And you ever have a headache? And wherever you go, you still have the headache, right? You go, you go in the living room, you have a headache. You go in the bedroom, lie down, still have a headache. You go outside, still have a headache. It's, you, we carry the body with us. I heard that um, Jai Takamar said once, he said, you know, asking, how do you, how do you continue? He goes, well, I just have to carry my body wherever I go, you know, just do that austerity, you know, this like body doesn't work so well. This is austerity, carry it around. So we're all doing that austerity, aren't we? Carrying around our bodies. And so we know what it's like to have a material body. You get hungry every four or five, six hours. You get tired every 18 or 16 hours. 
you, things bother you, mosquitoes bite you and itch you and people bite you and itch you. And sometimes it's too hot and it's too cold and you suffer. And I was in Lithuania um, in the last in November of 2000, 2019. And it was like freezing, freezing, freezing. And the wind was blowing like 3000 miles an hour. And we went on a walk and it was, I was like, you know, hell's probably better than this. You know, it was like so painful, <laughs> you know, cold, snowing everywhere, cold winds blowing. Uh, we know what it's like and everybody is experiencing that. And this is how we can increase our compassion just by looking at other people and thinking, yeah, we're all in the same boat. I know what you're going. You don't even know them, but you know what they're going through. You know that they're going to get hungry today and they're going to get tired and they're going to have to, to go to the toilet and somebody's probably going to upset them this week. And, you know, their body's going to be a little weird or they'll get tired this afternoon and they won't be able to concentrate or they're going to forget something or they'll get in a car accident sooner or later. You know all this. So that's what that verse means. By comparison to yourself, you understand the suffering of others. So if you don't have compassion, that's a good way to develop it. And that's what Krishna suggests. And so you can look at any person on the street or anywhere you are and look at them and think, they probably have some worries. They, they've probably been through some traumatic experience in their life. They've probably been through disappointment they've probably been severely chastised criticized let down and now in kali yuga it's not even probably not even probably it's like certainly they have right and the probabilities are like you're you're probably parents are probably divorced because like 50 60 percent and you've probably been abused when you were a kid because that's becoming more and more common so the probabilities the definitely's are there and the probabilities are increasing so it's it's bad and if if we feel not just think but we feel this it, it becomes very very powerful impetus to give krishna consciousness to others just like gorapriya sometimes gorapriya writes me i'm gonna embarrass her she writes me and said i see people suffering and i can't tolerate it and i feel her suffering but i think this is the heart of a Vaishnava. This is compassion. You see, not just people, animals. So I see them suffering and, and I suffer when I see them suffering. That's the quality of a Vaishnava. That's good. We all, we all want to have that. It's not, it's not easy to live that way because we're always sensitive to other people's suffering and people who are extremely sensitive sometimes. They, they have a difficult time when they see people suffer. It really hurts them. But at the same time, this is what it means to be a Vaishnava. And so this verse, Prahlad Maharaj is basically, that's what he's saying. I, I just, I'm so upset to see other people suffering, although I personally am fine. And that's why Prabhupada said that the problem with some spiritual practices is that people are fine with their spiritual practice, so they just go off in the mountains and remain fine with their spiritual practice. And Prabhupada often said that if we spread this movement, we go out and meet people, we go out and distribute books. So that's a greater austerity than what was performed in Satya Yuga of 100,000 years of meditation. Because to try to convince someone to be Krishna conscious it sometimes is an almost uh, Herculean task. And one has to often undergo insults and extreme inconvenience, etc., to try to do it. So it's a huge austerity. But that's how we become blessed by Krishna. Na tasmin manusheshu kashchidme priyakrtama. Nobody more dear than one who gives Krishna to others. So now you know how to become dear to Krishna. Be a compassionate soul who brings as many souls back to God as possible. Don't go back to Godhead alone. Go with the crowd that you bring with you. So you should all have crowds of people 
that you're making Krishna conscious. So you don't show up back to God at alone. And Krishna says, "You show up. If you show up alone, Krishna's going to say, uh, so when are the rest coming? Where are they? You don't want to say, Krishna, I'm the only one. And Krishna will say, how dare you? How dare you come here alone? I never told you to do that. What's wrong with you? Don't you understand? Don't you understand Bhagavad Gita? Hare Krishna. So that, that's an important verse. So I wanted to give it due, due time. Okay. So uh, the next verse is another less well known verse, but still. For the shloka wallas, they all know these verses. And it actually, it's interesting um, <laughs> because the next verse is going to explain what I just explained. Let me read it. I'll, I'll put it up for you. You can see it. Sometimes this happens. It's, it's, it's one of my greatest pleasures where I, I explain a verse and then I read Prabhupada's purport or I go to the next verse and it's what I just explained. And I'm not saying this out of pride. I'm just saying this that that I feel like for me it's it's like oh good I understand what Prabhupada taught because I just explained exactly what he said, you know. So I was I was thinking um, I was thinking that um, sometimes you know sometimes there's a question. Excuse me. Yeah. Sometimes there's a question that um, some temples they don't read. They don't read um, the Bhagavatam. They they stop it where Prabhupada left off, and then they go back to first canto. I was just in, I think, in Vrindavan, and they're reading through. They're on the eleventh or canto, I think. So. Um, let me stop sharing for a second. So I, I was see. I was thinking about this, and I was um, thinking how you know. I, I I sometimes I don't know if you have this experience, but sometimes there's certain devotees when they give class. It's like, was he? What did he memorize a transcript of a Prabhupada class? It's like it's like exactly. It's exactly that. So, like, we know, you know, we know Prabhupada. We've heard him, so we can repeat it. And if we hear him enough, we'll we'll be able to give our own purports, which will end up basically being what he said anyway. Which is it's so inspiring when you when you like give a class or make a comment and then go in the purport and go, oh my God, that's what I just said. So, I don't want to say I'm like Prahlad Maharaj, but I'm just saying that we're fortunate to have learned from Prabhupada. So let's read the next verse. My dear Lord Nishingadev, I see that there are many saintly persons indeed, but they are only interested in their own deliverance. Not caring for the big cities and towns, they go to the Himalayas or the forest to meditate with vows of silence, Mona Brata. They are not interested in delivering others. As for me, however, I do not wish to be liberated alone, leaving aside all these poor fool, fools and rascals. There. I do not wish to be liberated alone. That is a good verse to remember, a good sentence to remember, good phrase. I do not wish to be liberated alone, leaving aside all these poor fools and rascals. I know that without Krishna consciousness, without taking shelter of your lotus feet, one cannot be happy. Therefore, I wish to bring them back to shelter at your lotus feet. Shouldn't it be the shelter? I wish to bring them back to, shelter, to the shelter. Shouldn't it be the shelter of your lotus feet? Back to shelter at your lotus feet. Anyway. We have to ask Nadia. She knows English better than I do. What do you say, Nadia? I wish to bring them to the shelter of your lotus feet. Isn't that better? Yes, Maharaj. 
uh, for I wish to bring them back. It could sometimes it could this may not be exactly what's in the book. It's just mistyped here. Sometimes they want you to tell them. Yeah. So um, yeah. So let's continue reading. Um, well, before we go to the next verse, the next verse is changing the topic a little bit. So, um, so yeah, yeah, I, so basically it's saying the same thing. I want people to be happy. And now he starts talking about material tangle, entanglement based on sex desire. And this is a famous verse. So I'm going to read the Sanskrit. Yan mai tu nadi grihameri shukam hitu chang kandu yanena karayogi vadu kadu kam tripyanti neha kripana bahudu kabaja kandu tivan manasi jam vishahita diraha. Translation Have you heard that verse before? Maituni means sexual desire. Grihameri, you understand. Sukham, happiness of Grihastha life. Tucha means um, touch, right? What's the word? What does Tucha mean? Prabhupada, um, I cannot find it. Grihameri um, Sukham, Tucha. Oh, Tucha means insignificant. I thought it meant touch. So um, the happiness of Grihastha life is insignificant. Uh, the happiness of sex is insignificant, which is an interesting statement since um, materialistic people think it is the highest pleasure and hear Pallad saying, nah, it doesn't rate on my pleasure chart. It doesn't even get to zero. It's negative. Um, and so then he says, um, it's just an itch and um, it brings the consequences you know, not so good all the time. Um, and you'll never be satisfied. And yeah, basically control it. I will read the translation. Sex life is compared to the rubbing of two hands to relieve an itch. Griha medi, so-called grihastas who have no spiritual knowledge, think that this itching is the greatest platform of happiness, although actually it is a source of distress. You say, well, it's not a source of distress. Yeah, but relationships are a huge source of distress, aren't they? And sex is central in, in most relationships and it complicates things and it does cause distress. And specifically, it also refers to the byproducts of sex. Of course, children are um, wonderful and bring so much happiness. But they also bring a lot of distress along with the happiness. It's not you don't you don't just get happiness with kids. You get distress, and they get distress also. So it's it's not just sex is enjoyable and it's over and yeah. Then then there's sometimes abortion, so the the fetus is not happy, and all the psychological problems that come with that for the women who do it, at least for many of them, and. Um, Raising a family is not easy. You will find out when you do it. It's a lot of work. The Kripanas, the fools who are just the opposite of Ramanas, are not satisfied by repeated sensuous enjoyment. Those who are dira, however, who are sober and who tolerate this itching, are not subjected to sufferings of fools and rascals. But also, um, when, when there's a discussion of suffering, this, is, this was something that I didn't understand in the beginning when I was first coming to the temple to hear the lectures. I was still a student, just beginning to learn about Krishna consciousness. And they would always say, you're suffering. There's suffering. The world is suffering, 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 suffering. And I was thinking, suffering? I have a car. My parents send me money, all the money I need. I go to school. I ditch my classes half the time. I... I play guitar all day. I'm having a great time. Uh, I won't tell you all the other things I'm doing. I don't want to embarrass myself. But I was thinking, this is the life. All oh, my friend, you know, I'm not living at home. I'm like 19. I don't have to, to deal with parents. Half of my best friends are, are, are in, the, in the same college. 
uh, we're living it up. And then I would come to the class and they'd say, you're suffering. And I would think, no, I'm not. <laughs> I come back in the next class, you're suffering. And I would think, why do you say I'm suffering? I'm not suffering. It's like, like this life I have is so easy. I hardly have any classes. And the Gita was one of my classes. Was all I had to do was read the Gita. That was it. There was no homework. So that was like, that didn't take much time. And I had a couple other classes that didn't take much time. I, I spent, um, I spent maximum 10 hours a week in school and homework. That's it. So I had, you know, whatever, like 70, 80 hours left to play around. So I was thinking, if my life stays like this, it's pretty good, you know, just, you know, figure out how to pass, get passing grades. Your parents will keep sending you money and you like live it up, you know? No, you're suffering, you're suffering. You say, what are they talking about? Suffering, suffering, what are they talking about? So after like five weeks, it was like, ding, ba, 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 ba. And it's like, okay, now I understand. They mean birth and death. You're gonna suffer birth and death because I couldn't understand that. So it's the same thing in this verse, what Prahlad Marsh, you know, we're talking about um, people are suffering and the devotee says, well, they don't look like they're suffering. Actually, some of them look like they're happier than I am. I'm the one who's suffering. You know, so I can't control my mind. I can't find a husband. Oh, well, the male devotees are all nutty. You know, half the devotees are fanatics. You know, I'm the one who's suffering. You know, they're, you know the karmis, they, they just do what they want. Eat their ice cream and pizza whenever they want. They don't care. There's no guilt. I'm full of guilt and shame. They don't have it. I'm the one who's suffering. <laughs> I think Krishna. Have you ever felt like that before? I know the answer. You don't have to raise your hand. Yeah, I've, it's already raised. I can see it. So, so this is what Prahlad Maharaj means, you know. Um, if you're sober and sense controlled, you're not subjected to suffering. What suffering? Repeated birth and death. Where, whereas the materialistic people, they are enjoying their senses for a while. That's true. And they're enjoying their senses in ways we restrict ourselves. That's true. They're getting sensual gratification. That's true. But there are consequences to it, right? It, things you, some things you do do destroy your mind and body, and we know that. But ultimately, even if they're very sattvic and they live a pure life and they're happy, they're suffering because they're going to come back. And if you don't believe that that's suffering, I have a question for you. If I could put you in a womb for nine months right now, would you be willing to go in there? Yes or no? All right. If I could put you into nursery school right now, what about that? How about puberty? Did you like puberty? Was that good? Uh, can you think of some teachers you didn't like that you'd have to go in their class again? I mean, just go through it. It's like, no, nah, I don't think so. I, I, I'd do better to avoid going through that. I mean, just thinking about puberty and that whole 16 year old and having to deal with that, that's enough to send me back to God and detach me from everything. So I don't have to come back and deal with that again, right? Hare Krishna. And then, and then my girlfriend leaves me and I want to commit suicide. I don't want to go through that again, right? Do you? How do you, and what you know, and unlimited varieties of other crazy things that could happen. So that's the idea. So we we're we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand that what we see as enjoyment has all these consequences, which are not enjoyment at all. And Krishna explains that in the Gita that happiness and passion it has consequences. So. You know, we're, we're preparing this TED talk on happiness. And there, there's one thing we're probably not going to talk about. It may not be applicable to people in general. Um, maybe we'll talk about it. We'll see. But if you think, I want to do this because it will make me happy. Most people don't think, well, will it make me happy in five hours? Will it make me happy tomorrow? 
What about next week? Will it make me happy? What about next month? What about next year? So, so don't measure the happiness of this activity by the present. Measure it fully now and in the future, and then add it up, divide it up, and then you'll get your happiness number. And so basically Krishna is saying in the mode of passion, you will get happiness, but it's going to degrade into some consequence, which is not happiness. So you got to add the two numbers and divide by two, and then you can get your number of happiness. And the misery usually outweighs the happiness. Then Krishna says, but if you live in a mode of goodness, then you won't have that. You will, you will do the right things that won't have negative consequences and you'll actually be happy. But you'll get attached to that happiness and you'll want to just come back and go, life is good. Let's do it again. So then you come back in the womb and then suffer. So you lose. But anyway, happiness in the mode of passion, it's a mathematical equation. You get, okay, on the scale of zero to 10, I got 10 points of happiness for four minutes and I got 10 points of misery for four years. Like, so I don't think so, right? Would you buy a product that only worked for four minutes because it was like amazing? And you spent the next four years spending all your money fixing it? Probably not. So that's the idea. And most people don't think that way, right? So that's what Prahlad Maharaj is saying. Just have to clarify that because what he's saying sounds so like heavy, right? Said so it's just like sex desires and itch that get you in all kinds of trouble. So the Vedic system is control it, you you know, direct it so it doesn't direct you. And life is like that. You have to control your senses and mind. Otherwise, they control you. They direct you. They push you around. And then you do things that you really wouldn't have decided on your own to do. But the modes of nature pushed you because you allowed yourself to be in the modes of nature. And then you lament. Why did I do that? That was stupid, right? Is that your mantra? Why did I do that? That was stupid. Like maybe you should change your mantra to I'm glad I did that. That was smart. Better mantra, right? Don't you think? Spend the rest of your life. Why did I do that? I'm so stupid. Maybe we can make a video, you know, have two people. Why did I do that? I'm so stupid. And the other one, says, I'm glad I did that. I'm so smart. And they go back and what did you do? Oh, I did this. What did you do? I did this? I chanted Hare Krishna. I got up early in the morning. I'm glad I did that. I feel so good. What did you do? I got up at 11 a.m. and ate pizza and ice cream and then went back to sleep. Why did I do that? I'm so stupid. Yeah. So the way Maya works is, she makes you think you want to do these things and enjoy them when actually you're being forced to. And the best example is cigarettes. I like to smoke. Oh, really? You like to smoke? I think you're forced to smoke because no one who has a brain would smoke. So you think you like to do it. Am I just going, ha, ha, ha. I've got you thinking you like to do it when actually you're totally forced to do it and you have no idea you're being forced to do it. Ha, ha, ha. You'll never stop. You'll never get out of this because you don't even know you're in it. Right? That's how Maya works. You, Maya makes you think. Maya's got you on string. She's pulling you everywhere and she makes you think, I'm making all these decisions myself. I'm completely free. Isn't it? Maya is so expert, right? I'm giving myself lung cancer and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm doing this because I want to. If you're doing this because you want to, you need to get your head examined because something's wrong with you. Nobody will try to kill themselves and no sane person will try to kill themselves. And that's what you're doing in the name of, I want to do this. <laughs> and the famous one, right? You're talking to people and they're saying, you're saying, you know, you'd be happier if you controlled your senses. Like if you didn't smoke, if you didn't drink, you didn't do these things, you'd be happier. And they say, I could stop smoking if I want to. And I say, no, you can't. Because you would have already stopped. You're going to need a lot of help to stop because you're being forced to do it. 
in the name of I could do, I, I do it because I want to, I could stop if I want. No, no, no. That's Maya's trick, right? Yes. And I'm enjoying this. And as long as, as long as you think you're enjoying something that's keeping you away from Krishna, Maya's got you completely trapped. She can go to sleep. You're like, you're, you're dead. I don't have to worry about you. You're, you're, you're definitely com coming back in another body in the next life because you have no idea what's going on, right? So that's what she tries to do. Convince you you're free, convince you that this is enjoyment and you're totally setting, setting yourself up for suffering. Do you know anybody, maybe you had this experience, where they suffer and they think, oh, let's try it a different way. And they run into another wall. Oh, let's try it a different way. And then they run into another wall. Like, like, I don't know why so many bad things are happening for me. And they keep trying and trying. And they never stop and think, maybe there's another way out of this. They just keep doing the same thing. Because you know why? Because Maya gives them a break between the suffering. You know, okay, today you get Saturday off. No suffering today. And like, ah, life is good. And then, you know, Sunday comes, it gets worse. Monday through Friday, it's bad. Why is bad? You know, and they, it's just like they're very determined to enjoy in spite of it all. Oh, it's good that they're determined, but it's a sign of foolishness. We shouldn't be that determined. We should take note. Oh, there's walls everywhere I go. Maybe there's somewhere without a wall, and I just don't know where it is, and I need to find out. A lot of people never think that way, right? So Prabhupada gives the example. He said, sometimes a dog will come, ruff, 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 and you're like, get away, get away. And if you're in India, they're not always so nice, and in maybe other countries, they're not always, it's changing now, but they're not always so nice to dogs because they're like, the dogs are street dogs, and they're, you know, a lot of them carry rabies and like, don't get near me. And like, I got to dress the deities, don't look at me, you know, like that. So, you know, sometimes they'll throw a stone or get away or knock them in the head with a stick or something. You know, we don't, wouldn't normally do that, um, at least not in America generally, although people would sometimes do it if the dog were about to bite you or something. Yeah. But but so Prabhupada gives that example. I guess it's more common in India than it is in America that you know a dog comes and you like hit it or throw a stone at it. And then he comes back again. Rub, rub, rub. And he comes back. Rub, rub, rub. And he keeps throwing the stone. And he keeps coming back. And Prabhupada said, That's us. Maya keeps throwing a stone at us and we keep coming back. Try again, try again, try again. Banging your head into the wall every time. Hare Krishna. Have you ever had that experience, ladies and gentlemen? You keep banging your head in the wall and you keep banging into the same wall. And it's like, you know, it's, it, it's as I've often said, it's really important if you want to be Krishna conscious to turn all the switches on in your brain. Because if they're not turned on, you're going to keep walking into walls and just going, oh, that, was, that wasn't fun. Let's try it again this way. And you won't realize what's actually happening. So, and how do you turn all the switches on in your brain? You just read Prabhupada's books, hear a lot of classes, you know, think about these things, talk about these things. But when you think about them and talk about them, they're all obvious, isn't it? It's like, yeah, this is so obvious. Why don't I think this way? Well, one of the reasons we don't think this way is because we don't talk about it. And one of the reasons we don't think this way is because we don't read enough. So if we don't read enough, we don't think about it. If we don't think about it, we don't talk about it. So what do we talk about? We talk about what we think about. And what do we think about? Whatever we put into our eyes and our ears, that's what we think about. So if you put in Prabhupada's books, that's what you think about. And then the switches get turned on and you see all this. It's like, oh yeah, these people this is really bad. And, you know, I used to do this and it's, this didn't work. It's all clear. You can't be Krishna conscious and be in the clouds. You have to be clear, right? I mean, definitely. You agree, El Tigre Chino? You agree? You got to be clear. You got to be smart. It's not a matter of IQ. So, women are less intelligent. They, yeah, well, why are all the women becoming devotees and all the men at the bars? At least in Mexico, they are, you know. So it's not a matter of material intelligence. I don't know about in Chile, but I know in Mexico. You know. 
all the women are at church and all the men are at the bar, basically. Is it like that in your, any of your countries? If the men aren't at the bar, they're at the job. You know, they're working eight days a week or something. And the women are at church. Yeah. Hare Krishna. That's your comeback line, ladies. Wolf, you guys are so intelligent. How come you're all drinking beer and all the women are in church? That's your comeback. You need a good comeback, right, for that one. Right? Okay. Um, less intelligent is a comparison. Less intelligent who? Let's say less intelligent than men, but not the men that aren't devotees. They're not very smart. Are they? Whoever becomes a devotee is the most intelligent. Okay, I'm going to go to the chat because we have to stop at 10. So let's see what's in the chat. Uh, question from Krishna Karshani. Is the level of compassion you're talking about possible to exhibit for most of us, Kanishtas? Well, Prabhupada answered this question. Um, well, the question was asked, what if you don't have compassion? And Prabhupada said, serve the movement of compassion. So it's kind of like, I want to help the poor people. I don't have any money. So I line up with you. You have all the money and you have all the clothes and the food and the shelter, whatever they need. And I just work for you and I give it to them. So now it's like I'm rich. It's like I'm a rich man, but I don't have any money, but I'm acting like one. So I'm serving out the compassion of Prabhupada in the form of his books and the Maha Mantra and, and his teachings. And of course, by doing that, compassion will develop. And um, Prabhupada would also say, well, don't remain a Kanishta. You know, if you come to the level of giving Krishna consciousness, you're no longer a Kanishta. At least if you have some desire to help people and you're actively engaging in it, we can't call you a Kanishta. Because Kanishtas don't really see Krishna in anyone's heart, and so they're not interested in giving Krishna consciousness. And the Uttamas see Krishna into everyone's heart, so they don't think anybody needs Krishna because he's already there. So the, you have to be on the Madhyam level to see that people need Krishna. And at least have some desire, even if it's just out of duty, to serve your guru. So then we have another question. Um, should we see suffering of other and our own suffering as something negative? It seems we need suffering to back on a right path. Um, suffering is, is can be the most positive thing that could ever happen to somebody if it brings them to Krishna. And I don't think any of us would have come to Krishna if there wasn't sufficient suffering. And sometimes the suffering is mental, just I, I want to know the truth and I don't know and I'm suffering because I'm in ignorance. It could be that. Or the suffering could be deeply emotional. Like I, my heart is empty. Everything I do, it's, it's empty. I can't find satisfaction. Or the suffering can be existential. You know, my life is miserable. Everywhere I go, I run into walls. I'm looking for answers. There must be a better way. If there's a God, why am I suffering? So, but also you can say that suffering, suffering potentially can be beneficial, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will be because it depends what you do with it. You know, it's like we we're saying, someone suffers, they just try harder to enjoy instead of coming to their senses and thinking, well, maybe I'm in the wrong consciousness. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this or I should be thinking differently. So suffering in itself, you know, everybody suffers. It doesn't bring everyone to Krishna. There has to be some piety there for sure. And there has to be some intelligence. And if there's not sufficient piety or some scars, then the suffering, it's not going to be enough. You just have to have more of it. So, we can all count our lucky stars that we translated the suffering we went through into a search for Krishna. And that we concluded that we can be free from suffering by being Krishna conscious. So we're fortunate. So we utilize the suffering well. 
my suffering before I was a devotee was all intellectual. It's like, I have to know the truth. Otherwise, what's the point of doing anything? I didn't really want to do anything. So I think it's stupid. Why you want to, how can you do anything if you don't even know why you exist? It doesn't make sense. So it was a lot of like, like on a physical level or emotional level, the sensual level, I wasn't suffering, not so much. Generally, not hardly at all. But intellectually, I was, because it was, it was very depressing to be alive and not know why. At least for me, it was. So that's good. I used it to find Krishna consciousness. And the Bhagavad Gita relieved that. Okay, we have from Nadia. When you tell people the truth, they don't really want to do all these stupid things that no one in his right mind would do that. They get angry and say something like, why are you telling me these things? Don't disturb me. Yeah, that's Chanaka Pandit. Well, we give a fool good advice, he becomes angry. And this is like perennial wisdom that the truth will set you free, but first it'll disturb you. It'll make you angry. You, I don't know if you remember this story I told. I was Years ago, I was in Jamaica. And I went to, a, I don't know, massage or chiropractor or doctor or whatever. I had some problem. Same problem I have now with my hip. Because I'm so hip. I have a problem with being hip. Trying to be too hip. Maybe I'm trying to be so hip, my hip hurts. I don't know. Could be, right? So... We ended up talking about whatever, and I gave her a higher taste. So in the higher taste, as you may know, the beginning is all arguments why you should be vegetarian, and then the rest of the book is the recipes. So it's, it was meant to convince people of the need to be vegetarian. So I went to her one day, and she said, come back tomorrow for another treatment. I think they were doing some sound treatment, you know, like that. And so she said, I read your book and I hate it. And I say, why? She says, because it's true. And I have to give up eating meat. So there, there it is. Like, as ignorance is bliss, that's the whole point. Ignorance is bliss. Hare Krishna. Right? If you don't know it, what you don't know won't hurt you. Have you have that saying? You heard that? What you, you don't, you know, don't tell so and so Prabhu that he, you know, his wife just ran off with you know his best friend. What you don't know won't hurt you. Yeah. He just thinks she's on vacation somewhere. Yeah. But when he finds out, yeah, but it already happened. But he doesn't know, so ignorance is bliss. Yeah. So. Um, now you, Miss Nadia, you, as expert preacher as you are, you are going to be able to tell people the truth without agitating them. Because if you have medicine and it tastes very bitter and you give it to someone, they're gonna go, yuck, and spit it out all over your face, right? So you, want to make sure the medicine tastes sweet so you mix it up with cherry syrup and this and then the bitter stuff is like it's kind of in the background now you know and it gets down so that's the expertise of a preacher and sometimes the preacher or the teacher already knows when i say this people are going to get upset so i have to preface it with like three hours of you know information so i could finally say the one thing so they won't spit at me Right, or or I have I have to I meditate on it like daily. You know how am I going to explain this to people because they're going to spit at me when I say this, and so I think about it and I develop strategies and ways to communicate and you know feed them lots of prasadam and have nice kirtan. Come on, very humble. So maybe maybe you could consider this. You don't have to believe it. That's just a thought. I, you know, it's from the Bhagavad Gita. You know. You know, I'm just throwing it out there. You know, open minds are like parachutes. Your mind's closed, it's going to sink. You got to be open. And like, and they're like, okay, you're a fool and a rascal. 
I got to take this call because they're wondering what I'm doing. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, I'm just finishing. Okay. Uh, yeah. You have this Prabhupada Saraswati, you know, you said, my dear sir, you're the most intelligent. You're the greatest. You're this and that. And you have a straw in your teeth. It's like a, I just have one request. Forget everything you ever learned. It's all useless. So that's the preaching strategy. You, you come on, like if you come on humble, you know, just maybe you could consider this. This has helped me. It's helped millions of people. Maybe it'll help you. It's actually helped 20 zillion billion living entities in the, since the universe began. Maybe you might find some value in it, possibly, you know. You know, Albert Einstein studied it, and this one studied it. Maybe you too might learn something, you know. And if you don't, it's fine. Just be open to it. Is that okay? And I go, okay. And then you tell them. You know, say, I know this is going to blow your mind. I know this is hard to believe. And then you say, you know, you had a past life. You'll have a future life. You know, that's, you have to just be expert. <clears throat> I learned that in my workshop on how to teach seminars, that if you want to get people to open their minds, you tell them, you don't have to believe this. I just asked for the next half hour, hour, whatever, however long your talk is, for the next two minutes to explain this point, I just ask you to be open to it because at least theoretically try to understand, be open to it because you could never understand something that you're not open to, correct? So it's powerful. So you ask them, you know, and they're like, and, the, and nobody's going to say, no, I'm not going to be open because it, you know, makes them look like a complete jerk, right? sitting in a crowd of 100 people. I'm not going to be open to this nonsense. Everyone's looking at you like, get out of here. You know, just listen to the poor girl. You don't have to believe it. Just be open. You know, everyone will support you. It's a super, it's a super powerful tactic. And then he says, just be open. You know, this has helped me. It's helped millions of people. Maybe it'll help you. Just, you know, and if it doesn't, that's fine. You can throw it away, but just now be open to it. And then everybody's open. Such a great tactic, Hare Krishna. So for those of you who came after 9.30, you um, didn't know that I had to start class early today. We'll go back to our regular schedule on Wednesday, but I have to do some service um, now. So we started early and uh, I won't be at the Japa Sangha, I don't think. And I found this paper, Tanya. I think this is your assignment, isn't it? Can you read it, what it says? The many manifestations of unhealthy fanaticism in ISKCON. Was that the assignment I gave you? I don't think so. Mine was uh, uh, on, on the psychological Problem? issues. Yes. Yeah, well, this is one of them. Yeah. This, is, this is one of the, the, this is one chapter in your book. Okay. <laughs> I just found this today. I wrote it down. So can you write it down also? So and then I can, I don't have to keep it any longer. I will, I will help. I will help you. I've seen them all. But there's probably a few yet to come that I may not have seen yet. But how do you push? Okay. Thank you for coming. We will. Continue on Wednesday with uh, hearing Prahlad Marsh's prayers. These are quite famous prayers. He's, he, just remember, he's only five years old. So he's only five. So he knows what he's talking about, right? He's got all this life experience, you know, you know like, like how well, he learned it all from Narada Muni. So five years old, it's okay. It doesn't matter. It's just like you can learn from Prabhupada, you can be whatever, but you learn from a pure devotee, then you have all the experience of the universe. And you can, you can 
speak to great scholars, scientists, people twice your age, three times your age, because you've heard from a peer devotee. That's how it works. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Nadia says, I just smile and people are ready to do whatever I ask them to do. That works for girls, not for guys. So you have an unfair advantage. When all, when all the women go out in book distribution, I'd like, I'd go up to a guy and he'd go, like, get out of here, you idiot. And then 30 seconds later, one female devotee would go up to him and he'd just, okay, I'll take a book. How much money do you want? I'm like, damn, why didn't I take birth as a woman? This is like so hard to distribute books as a man. It's not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> I think it was, it was a passing thought. It only lasted three seconds. It wasn't serious, but sometimes I would think unfair advantage, unfair advantage. I mean, I'm serious. There were so many guys who would not talk to me, were quite nasty. And then women would come up and they were like melted butter in their hands. Okay. Hare Krishna to all of you. Srila Prabhupada, Kijay, Go Premanandi, Hari Hari Bo.